This is the STS-133 interview with Mission Specialist Alvin Drew. Uh, t tell us about the place where you grew up, your hometown, and, and what it was like growing up there, and, and, and how that place influenced who you've become. Okay. Uh, grew up uh, first off in the suburbs of Washington, D.C., a place called Lanham, Maryland, in Prince George's County. Um, and then when I was about four, we actually moved into the city over in the northeast side of the place, in a township called Brooklyn. Uh, probably most famous for its proximity to Catholic University and all the Catholic colleges that are around there. Uh, it was a, a, a working middle class neighborhood, a mm -hmm. um, mix of white collar and blue collar, uh, middle class African Americans who were in the place. And they all had a, just a strong work ethic uh, to kind of pull themselves up from the bootstraps. Uh, we had just gotten through the you know, Civil Rights Act 1964 and the opportunities were open out there and there was a strong sense of um, optimism and ambition out there that they kind of they brought across. So we had uh, two doors up for me uh, was a man who'd been an undertaker uh, and I think he recently retired from having his own funeral home and he had started off uh, literally as a sharecropper in Mississippi and it worked his way up to having a, a good nest egg and he was intent on beating into me the fact that um, I could do anything in the world I wanted to. There was no law, there was no, no segregation holding me back. Uh, but I need to have an education. This is the, nobody could ever take education back from me, and uh, hard work ethic and a good education would take me anywhere I wanted to go. And uh, that was kind of the mood of the entire neighborhood around me. Everybody out there was living by that ethic, whether they were expressing it uh, that uh, verbally or not. Hmm. Did, did you get a, get a chance to see uh, the the DC? Um, uh, Maryland area from space on your on your previous space flight? Yeah, we got to fly over. I remember having those guys let me know when we have got this world map program that has this moving you are here dot on it right. to let me know when we were coming up on Washington, D.C. And, and I got about five minutes notice and I ran up and took a look out there. Uh, you can pick out where the Anacostia River splits off from the Potomac and that's probably your biggest indication that you're you know, looking at Washington, D.C. Uh, there's no nice diamond shape around the city that lets you know where it is. It's just a, just a gray smear uh, from all the asphalt and concrete in the middle of downtown uh, that lets you know that you're looking at a city at all. Mm -hmm. well, what was that moment like when just, just kind of recognizing and realizing that, you know, hey, I've, I've, I've gotten here and come from there and, I, you know, I'm here 200 miles up, you know, and, and I've, I've, uh, I'm, a, I'm living this accomplishment that I've set out to do. It's probably the same sensation when you climb a mountain or you're climbing a cliff face and you look back and you have a sense of the distance that you've covered. You know, up until that point, you're looking at those three feet in front of you and you go there, you know, three feet at a time and you look back and you've covered a few miles when it's all said and done. That same thing that I've gone from there to here. Okay. Uh, every accomplishment uh, begins with some form of motivation. Now you just gave, gave us a, a story about somebody motivating you. Uh, you've been an astronaut here for about 10 years. What, what set you off on, on that, that trick and that, that road to, to, to pursue this line of work? For me, the motivation was just primal. You know, it's like you know, people get hungry or you get tired and you want to sleep, you want to eat. Uh, from the time I was four years old, I needed to fly. Uh, I remember going out to what is now Baltimore, Washington International Airport uh, to watch my dad go off on a business trip and just absolutely obsessed with the planes I saw taking off in and out of there and mm -hmm. knowing then at four years old that that's what I wanted to do. Uh, it was a, this was September of 67. October of 68, a year later, I was in first grade watching uh, the Apollo 7 launch on television. Our principal you know, took out our little black and white TV and we watched that launch. And I watched that, and I was torn, like, no, I need to do this, too. <laughs> I, I went home, you know, very troubled, asked my dad, you know, says, no, what should I do? Can I, should I be an astronaut, or should I be a pilot? He goes, you can do both those things. All these astronauts have been pilots, and that, well, well, that just sealed it for me. That was what I was going to go try and do. I didn't know about the astronaut part. That seemed there weren't too many, weren't too many astronauts there, uh, but I was certainly going to go fly an airplane. Wow. So at five or six years old, that was, that was solidified. In it was scary life. to think that some <laughs> kindergartner made my career choice for me, yes. Uh, recount for us, uh, if you would, the steps that you've, you've taken um, in your military career to, to get to the NASA Astronaut Corps. Uh, military career started with the Air Force Academy back in 1980. I uh, went there because 
Uh, if I wasn't going to necessarily fly spacecraft, I wanted to design them. Uh, one of my heroes at that point was Clarence Kelly Johnson, who was who made the SR-71 and several other planes for Lockheed. Mm -hmm. And if I couldn't fly planes, which I you know, would still wanted to do but didn't think it was necessarily possible, this was a place to do it, one of the foremost aeronautical and astronautical engineering schools in the country. Uh, I got out there and I was being recruited by the physics department uh, to become a, a physics major. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the instructors there mapped it out for me uh, and, and just trying to give me you know, why I should want to be a physics major. He said, you get a technical degree, you know, like physics, um, get a good great grade point average coming out of the Air Force Academy, uh, go to pilot training, you know, become a decent pilot, and if you've got a good grade point average and you're a decent pilot, you can go to test pilot school and become a test pilot. And from there, it says, who knows? You know, all of our current Air Force astronauts are test pilots. And, and he had just, put, just mapped that out with flagstones for me, and that's about what I did. I came out of the Air Force Academy with the degrees in physics and astronautical engineering. Uh, I went off to become a pilot flying helicopters, uh, first in combat rescue and special operations. Eventually, I went to jet pilot training and then to the Navy test pilot school. I uh, served most of the 90s as a test pilot, and in, uh, in coming for the class of 2000, I applied uh, to become an astronaut. Okay. Tell me about some of the, uh, some of the time you spent uh, as a uh, combat uh, helicopter uh, pilot. Uh, they were exciting. Uh, I was in at the very inception of what is now the Air Force Special Operations Command. I, I, obviously, I wasn't paying attention. I didn't know it was coming until they hauled us out one day for a parade and says, you're now the Air Force Special Operations Command. Uh, that's good. Well, uh, just a few short months later, uh, we were going into Panama uh, to go and bring back Manuel Noriega. Uh, and that was going to be my first uh, few combat missions uh, doing that. And things just never quite calmed down after that. We were always somewhere in the world. Uh, in the middle of some type of scrape and special operations because uh, they're the ones you send if you're short of a full war mm -hmm. uh, where you're doing things. But even when there was warfare going on, as it was in their, uh, the first uh, Gulf War over in, in by Saudi Arabia, we were in the middle of that as well. So a year later, I was seeing combat missions over um, Saudi Arabia and Kuwait. Wow. That sounds pretty intense. <laughs> it was. It was, it was a, a good few years, but it wasn't something I'd do you know, for, for 20 years. It was, it was, it's a, it was a burnout job. Okay. All yes. right. Um, do you recall um, the uh, the time um, of, of getting the call of, of, of hey, do you want to come down and be an astronaut? Do you have a story about you know what that was like when you got that call? Yeah, ironically enough, that was 10 years ago yesterday. Uh, wow! <laughs> I got a call from our our deputy center director who just retired recently as a Kennedy Space Center director, um, asking if I was interested in coming out to be an astronaut and I'm trying to contain myself and say, oh, I said, I told him I said if I'd make a joke I said I could come to like a job like that maybe I'll sign up and go ahead and do that <laughs> so, well come out here let me know how it grows on you and then I hung up the phone closed the door to my office and, and, and jumped up and down you know. <laughs> okay cool yes tell us how you would characterize the, the value of education in your life and, and, and what it's uh, enabled you to do Education's been in my family's DNA. Uh, my family grew up in Washington, D.C. Uh, my parents were met at Dunbar High School, which back in the 19, late 40s, around 1950s, was one of the first attempts at a magnet school. Uh, the schools were segregated back then, and for African-American students who were excelling, that was where they would send these uh, children there, the students. Mm -hmm. uh, it was also a place for uh, African-Americans who had degrees, PhDs, who were waiting for their opportunity to teach at Howard University uh, to go and make their, uh, make their bones, uh, to show their credentials. And so my parents had were people who were aspiring uh, to become college professors were teaching them. So you'd have a guy who was with a PhD teaching them freshman chemistry. And they had some of the best education they possibly could have, and they saw that as a ticket for them to get out of poverty within the city. Uh, and so by the time I came around, uh, we were living a middle class existence based on the, you know, the tickets they'd earned from their education. And it was sure that um, my sisters, my brother, and I were all going to get education. So it was expected that we were going to go to college. It was expected that we were going to get good grades, uh, or at least give them the best possible effort. Uh, we understood that. And, uh, and my, my mother was a teacher in school. Uh, my father, after a career both in government and in private industry, once he retired, went and became a history teacher in high school. Uh, they held that whole thing in very high regard and they sent us to schools with some of the best teachers in the city and so I got exposed to some of the best teachers and so I had a good appreciation for what a, um, what good teaching and good education could do. Okay. You, you've, uh, you've flown once before. Um, tell us about what, what experiences stand out most in your mind about, about 
that whole that whole trip from the launch to to being you know up on orbit to the return. What what sticks out in your mind about about that experience? A few things come to mind. First was uh, we had a few. Uh, guest stars on our mission. They were, they were astronauts on our crew, but they, they obviously they, you know, their influence you know, went well beyond that. Uh, first and foremost among them was Barb Morgan. Uh, Barb, as you know, was the um, first runner-up for Krista McAuliffe for Teachers in Space um, for the, the flight aboard Challenger back in 1986. Um, I think that if anything happened to Krista, she would have been on that flight, and it was clear that had the program continued, she would have been her successor, would have been the next teacher to go up in space. As it turned out, ironically, it, she would be the next teacher to go up on a space shuttle 22 years later. And uh, the, the inspiring part of that journey obviously had a lot of the media's attention, and it was good to actually work with Barbara, and I didn't see this, this media superstar, but then just this very unassuming lady who was just fun to work with on a crew, uh, despite the historical burden that was on her shoulders. Uh, the other one was uh, Dave Williams, one of our Canadian astronauts uh, who had done very well here at Johnson Space Center, had ran a large part of the science directorate here. And in Canada, if nothing else, they, they're very um, enthusiastic about space travel and, and aeronautics and aerospace, and they're enthusiastic about those among them who do extremely well. And Dave filled both those squares, and so we had lots of uh, attention focused on Dave Williams as well. So that was the, the part running up to the flight. Uh, the actual launch uh, was exciting. Yeah. Uh, it was the very first flight uh, for Endeavour after it had been through an extensive refurb. Uh, it seemed like a brand new spaceship, and so we were you know, just making sure that it got a good shakedown on its way to orbit, literally. And uh, when I got to orbit, the part that sticks out most in my mind from that mission was about an hour and a half into the mission, because I had launched on the mid-deck and didn't get to see the launch. Uh, I was taping down a coaxial cable for our internet, and it was the first time I actually gotten up to a window. And of course, you're very busy during that time. I actually took, you know, took a few seconds just to go look out the window mm -hmm. uh, at what was the Chihuahuan Desert over in Mexico. And at that moment, uh, a satellite passed between me and the Earth. Wow. And uh, I don't think very many astronauts get a chance to see any other body besides maybe the Hubble or the space station, but just some other random satellite. And that was when my thought was, we're not in Kansas anymore. <laughs> I'm looking down on top of satellites passing beneath me. Uh, it was, a, it was a, one of those moments that, you know, just the, the, to see the Earth below, the, the curvature of the Earth, that breathtaking moment, and have it punctuated by that conjunction between us and that satellite uh, just stuck with me. Okay. Uh, all veteran crew on SDS-133, everybody has, has flown before. Uh, you've, you've got three crew members who have actually spent time up on station as uh, long-duration crew members. Uh, how much of a benefit will that be to, to having that experience uh, help in, in, in accomplishing this mission? Yeah. Let's go one step beyond that. There's going to be six space station crew members up there when we dock the space station. So by the time we get there, Steve Lindsay, Eric Bowen, and I will be the three members who have had no experience on board space station. The nine other crew members out there who will know where everything is, where everything's stowed, how everything works. And so we'll see them as kind of our you know, our seeing eye crew members to help us around. Yeah. Uh, they'll be extremely valuable to have. Uh, I liken it to you know, trying to go up Mount Everest without a Sherpa. Uh, these guys are the folks who know where all the trails are and how to get to places. So I think that uh, it was just a, a coup that we decided to start reflying space station veterans on board space shuttle missions uh, because it just that they're so much more efficient on board the space station when they get there. Uh, the content of the mission uh, has changed a lot since you first started training, still changing as we speak. Um, what kind of uh, challenge has that been for the crew to, to, to have to deal with that, and what kinds of adjustments have you had to make uh, because everything is changing almost constantly? It hasn't been that big a challenge. We understood at the beginning of this that our mission was going to be in flux. Uh, when we first signed us up for this, we were the very last shuttle mission, and we knew that as things did or did not get done on previous shuttle missions to ours that things would go on to and off of our task list uh, because we were going to be the last chance to get certain things done. Now since then we've, you know, we've moved in the second to last spot and we've added two spacewalks and our attitude was like well when, when it comes along we'll, we'll, we'll go with the flow. Uh, the, the big picture content really hasn't changed that much. The main part of our mission um, to bring up uh, Leonardo, uh, the, uh, the pressurized multipurpose module, and our Express Logistics Carrier 4 with the radiator has stayed the same. So that core, so everything else has been around the periphery of the mission and really haven't, hasn't rocked our waters too much, even though this is continuous churn. Okay. 
Uh, tell me about uh, how you would characterize the contributions of, of the thousands of people who work behind the scenes to ensure the success uh, of the mission and the safety of, of the crew for, for every, every mission? For me, every time I get to work with the, the whole greater community that, that's around STS-133 and uh, Utilization Flight 5 you know, on the space station, um, I'm always a little bit envious. Uh, that, uh, how do they do these things? And I, almost, you know, I work with mission control, and these guys have been working for years to get themselves to the point where they're in the front rooms and back rooms, and you know, the, you know, the, the way they converge on you know, solutions to problems, uh, like you've seen in Apollo 13. You know, we've seen miniature versions of that every time we do a simulation run. And to watch those guys you know, work in such great concert together every time under some pretty strenuous conditions impresses me. Uh, uh, the folks at the Cape who put this orbiter together and the, the, the thousands and thousands of hours of touch labor to refurbish the shuttle and turn it around for another flight. Uh, for me, it's always been a certain fascination with people who make something out of nothing. You know, metalsmiths, carpenters, uh, artisans. And this is what these guys do. And you talk to them and they, they don't they don't seem to get it. It's like, well, I'm just the guy who, who puts your reaction control system tank back in here or works on your, your main engines. Like, yeah, but I can't do that. <laughs> I don't know how you do that. Uh, and these guys come in every day with just, um, just a sense of dedication and pride in what they do. And, and it's just, and we just, we're just down at the Cape uh, for our first review of the orbiter and looking at the condition that it's in and then the pride these people have in their work. Um, it, it's really great to see that. It's also the folks in the program office you know, who work budgets and schedules and everything else. So watch that whole thing go in concert. Um, it amazes me that it works at all, much less how well it works. And I think it's just because that, that sense of mission and pride that everybody brings to work with them every day. Okay. Uh, if your launch schedule holds, um, you're scheduled to be on board the space station right around the, the time of the 10th anniversary of uh, the arrival of Expedition 1. That crew uh, es established continuous human presence on the space station. Uh, discuss, if you would, the significance of, of that milestone that, that, that they, they accomplished and the future of uh, space station to space exploration. Okay. The milestone, uh, what keeps coming back to my mind when I think about that was when Neil Armstrong's word when he stepped on the moon. You know, one small step for man, you know, one giant leap for mankind. 250 miles in space isn't very far. I mean, it's a longer drive to Dallas. <laughs> um, but you have to practice in your backyard what you're going to do on the other side of the world. Uh, we learned everything we were going to do on the moon right here in low Earth orbit. We practiced it here, and then we pushed out. If we're going to go and live places like the moon or Mars and beyond, uh, we need to have figured out how we're going to live off this planet we're not that far away from, as John just, Young described, as a can of beans. Mm -hmm. uh, and this was a place we're going to do that. Um, we're going to have this uh, outpost in space 250 miles up, and we're going to keep it continuously inhabited and for as long as we possibly can. And this is coming up on 10 years, and it's, it's, it's a small step in terms of distance. It's a giant leap, and it's been a giant leap since we first started doing this. Uh, this was the next giant leap into space back to the moon. Uh, we are working internationally. We're working with people who don't speak our language as their primary language. They don't even use our same measurement systems. They don't have the same culture. And sometimes the first time we put these components together for the first is on orbit, and it's working. Uh, we've never brought a piece back from space, you know, knock on wood, <laughs> um, because it didn't work, you know, because it didn't fit the right way. Um, this has been a major milestone. In, and when I look back, because I was here when that first mission went up, um, how much we've learned, how much smarter we are now 10 years later after continuously operating and constructing this, this vehicle in space than we were then. Uh, I would say that we are much better prepared for pushing out into the solar system and living there for long periods of time than we could have ever dreamed of back in 1998. Okay. Uh, give us, if you would, um, just a nutshell bullet, bulleted list of the key objectives of, of STS-133. Uh, in a nutshell, the big thing is to outfit and resupply the space station. Um, if this were a, a home or a, a structure like on the ground that happens to be in space, um, the analogy would be that we're putting a, a new walk-in closet uh, permanently attached to the space station, this, uh, uh, per this permanent multi-purpose module, and we're going to put a new either storage platform or deck uh, out, the, out there outside 
uh, the uh, Express Logistics carrier carrying a spare radiator, a new air conditioner, a spare air conditioner for the place. Mm -hmm. um, those are the big objectives, and everything else we're doing outside for these uh, spacewalks is repair. Uh, it, this is uh, two six and a half hour episodes of this old station, uh, <laughs> fixing up things that have, that have gotten old uh, in the 10 years they've been up there in space. Uh, and, and that's about those are the big, big objectives for this mission. And, and tell us, if you would, some of your key responsibilities um, on the mission as Mission Specialist 1. As Mission Specialist 1, I will be on the flight deck for Ascent, a uh, glorified flight engineer, uh, helping out with the rest of the crew during the eight and a half minute ride to orbit mm -hmm. and the subsequent hour of the orbital adjustments. Uh, after that, the next couple of days, I'll spend with uh, Steve Lindsay and Eric Bowe working the space shuttle's robotic arm uh, to do the inspection of the orbiter uh, to make sure that uh, we are in a, got a good clean bill of health. And I'll do that again once we've undocked from space station. And then finally, with, along with Tim Copra, I'll go out and do the two spacewalks that are scheduled. Okay. Uh, give us some background uh, or your best description of, of, of the uh, PMM. Um, kind of tell us you know, what it looks like and maybe how it differs from a regular multi-purpose logistics module, how it's been outfitted differently to, to allow it to uh, be a permanent part of space station. Now. Okay. Uh, so the, the PMM started off his life as an MPLM, a multi-purpose logistics module, uh, that we're simply going to attach permanently to the space station. Uh, if we, people aren't familiar with the multi-purpose logistics module. If you've ever seen those pods containers that the people come and drop off in your driveway to give you extra storage, that's what it is. It, it's a big connex uh, you know, for storing things. So we bring up big loads of transfer and we unload that thing and then we um, load it back up for things that need to come back to Earth and we take those things home. Well, this time we're not bringing it back home. Uh, the space station needs some place to store all of its stuff. Just as anybody who's got a house, you know, sooner or later the, the junk piles up and you need some place to store it. Well, we don't have a closet or a big closet uh, except above the Japanese experiment module. Uh, there's a small one up there. We needed something bigger. And that's the point is we're taking one of these pods containers and we're permanently attaching it to the space station. And there's a few things that come with that. Uh, these MPLMs, we're only going to be in space for you know, weeks at a time. And you won't worry about things like meteorites or debris hitting it and, and knocking holes in it. And so in this case, we need to outfit it with um, micrometeorite uh, debris shielding, uh, much like you see on the Columbus Laboratory, which is about the same dimensions as this, as this uh, PMM that we're going to dock. Uh, you know, people will be in there, so you want to have things like communications in there, uh, you know, the ability to um, have fire alarms ring inside, and, and things of that nature. I mean, it's still it's a closet, but if you're going to be in there, you need to be able to make it a habitable place. Uh, and so they've been doing modifications to this to make it a more permanent structure rather than this temporary addition to the space station that comes up and leaves with each shuttle. The uh, day after you make it to orbit, uh, you're scheduled to do um, a limited inspection of the shuttle's ex uh, exterior on the tiles. Uh, tell us about that that procedure and, and your involvement in it. Okay. On the, the second day in flight, uh, Steve Lindsay, Eric Bow, and I will be the three folks who operate the space shuttle's robotic arm, uh, mainly to inspect the leading edges of both wings and the nose cap on the shuttle and a few other uh, places around uh, to see if it suffered any damage from debris coming off the external tank uh, during ascent. Uh, as you know from the Space Shuttle Columbia mishap, uh, that was what caused that mishap was a foam hitting the leading edge of one of those wings and knocking a hole in it. So we'll take a package of sensors on a long boom, the orbiter boom sensing system, and get up close uh, images, uh, some of them 3D images and scans uh, of all those uh, vital areas on the outside of the shuttle to make sure our thermal protection is still in place. Okay. And uh, walk us through um, um, rendezvous and docking day and um, being sure to uh, touch on the part post-docking where you actually have to start getting the uh, logistics carry out of the payload band attaching it. Uh, the third day in space starts off with us chasing down the space station. Uh, I think it's several miles away and what we'll do is we'll get ourselves to a point about 600 feet below the space station. Uh, we'll, we'll do a quick flip beneath there so they can take some of their high-powered optics and take pictures of the rest of the shuttle that we couldn't inspect with the robot arm. And then we'll continue to fly out about another 400 feet in front of the space station. Uh, from there we'll align our docking port with the space station's docking port in its front and back up onto it. Um, in, a, in a slow waltz with the space station to do that. Once that's, we've got a good 
docking and a good, good airtight seal between us and the space station, we'll, uh, I think even before we open up the hatches and meet the crew, uh, we've got the express logistics carrier which needs to be uh, ready to come out of the payload bay right away. Mm -hmm. And so we'll, uh, that's going to be a, a choreographed you know, sequence of events between our robot arm and the space station's robot arm. Uh, the, the logistics carrier sits so far forward in the shuttle's payload bay that when it's docked, um, the front labs on the space station block the arm's ability to grab it. So we cannot grab that logistics carrier with our own robot arm. Uh, and so what will happen is uh, the space station's robot arm will be mounted forward on the space station. Uh, I believe it's either the node 2 or the lab. We'll reach into our payload bay and grab that logistics carrier out. Uh, once it's there, it can't get to where it needs to put that logistics carrier up on the space station truss. Mm -hmm. So it needs to reposition itself. So once that's out, it will go to a position to hand off to us. We'll take our space station, our space shuttle robot arm, and grapple um, that logistics carrier. And the space station arm with our two crew members, I believe Nicole Stott and Tim Copeland, and it will now have gone through the hatches and gotten aboard the space station, will reposition that arm off of the front of the space station up onto the mobile um, a servicing system, mm -hmm. which is just a big rail car. The front face of the truss is a set of railroad tracks, and this thing can trundle up and down these tracks to different work sites. Uh, he'll, they'll get it on that, that mobile servicing station, move out to where they need to, where they can put the, reach both the pallet, this express logistics carrier, and its installation site on board the truss. Mm -hmm. uh, we will move with the shuttle arm this carrier to a point out where the space station arm can get it, and that's called a hand back we'll hand it back to them. They'll grab it, move it on top of the space station truss, or well, the bottom of the space station truss, and, uh, and get it all plugged in. And then we go pick up with the rest of our day, you know, meeting and greeting with the space station crew. Okay. Um, you and uh, Tim Copri are scheduled to do two spacewalks uh, on the mission, as, as you mentioned. Um, the first one will also be your first spacewalk of your career. Uh, tell us about the anticipation level uh, from that. <laughs> uh, excited about it. And also, you know, just a little bit of apprehension because it's something that you want to get exactly right. Uh, spacewalks, uh, as you know, whether in the pool or in space, are challenging, both mentally, physically, and emotionally. Uh, they do uh, work you to some of your limits, and so I'm looking forward to that challenge. But I also want to make sure I you know I meet the, uh, each objective in those sp spacewalks. Uh, and so I'm looking forward to that. There are two EVAs uh, on this mission. You and uh, Tim Coper will, will go outside and do some things. Uh, kind of give us a, 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 a big picture overview of, of what the purposes of, of the EVAs are. Okay. Uh, for our mission, STS-133, our EVAs are a departure from the standard for the, our typical shuttle missions to the space station over the last 10 years. Uh, typical profile is you bring up a big chunk of the space station, some module, some component, some segment. Uh, the robotic operators go out and position it in place using the arm like a big crane, and the spacewalkers go out there and bolt it down. And like anything like you put on your house, you, know, you want plumbing, you, know, you want electricity, and increasingly in this century you want data uh, connections. So these guys will go out and put those plumbing lines, those electrical lines, and the data lines up to that particular new piece of the space station. Uh, for ours, we've got the PMM, the permanent um, multipurpose module, which is like a closet. You know, closets don't require a lot of plumbing, don't require a lot of, you know, the data don't require a lot of electricity, so we were just going to bolt this thing on. However, uh, somewhere along the line in our training flow, uh, we had a, a nitrogen tank on board the space station. It had a glitch. It wasn't uh, providing nitrogen. And this opened the door for us to have two spacewalks on the mission. They were looking to have us go out and either repair or replace this nitrogen tank. Uh, that tank, because of some really smart troubleshooting on the ground, got fixed. The task itself would have been more than enough for one spacewalk, but not quite enough for two. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the space station program put out a casting call for any other tasks that could be added on to fill up the time on the second spacewalk since we're out the door. Uh, found there was a long list of tasks, mm -hmm. more than two spacewalks worth that were out there. Uh, so even though the tank problem itself had gone away, these, this long list of tasks, none of which would have been important enough on its own to have merited a spacewalk, the conglomerate of them all uh, kind of went over the threshold where it was worth having two spacewalks to catch up the space station without using space station assets, uh, without uh, taxing the space station crew members extra time. They had their own scheduled spacewalks, but we're up there, we've got the assets, we've got the people, let's go ahead and go out and do these 
service repairs on the space station. So it, it much more resembles what we would call a stage spacewalk, something where the shuttle wouldn't be there, where you're servicing or repairing or outfitting the space station. And those are the two spacewalks uh, that we're going to do. Um, so it's a bunch of, I call them dogs and cats, uh, but no elephants. Okay. Then go ahead uh, and, and if you would give us a, an overview of the tasks you're going to do on the first spacewalk, EVA-1. Okay. okay, our first spacewalk that we're going to do, uh, it starts off and the, the bulk of that is going to be cleaning up from the last spacewalk that our space station crew members did. Uh, several months ago, we had a uh, ammonia pump uh, for our cooling system uh, fail mm -hmm. aboard the space station, and we need to go and replace it. Uh, that task is very long and involved, and they got the new pump in place, they got the space station in a configuration where it could sustain itself, uh, but the old pump needed to be put away, and a lot of the, uh, ex the tools and things that were out there had to be put away too. And the next opportunity to do that was going to be during our spacewalk. So we will start right off uh, with going out to pick up that failed uh, pump and putting it back in the storage location for the replacement pump. It's got a big tent that it goes into and we'll put it in there and bolt it down. Uh, once that's done, uh, Tim Coper will go off and, 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 and we'll split up and do different separate tasks. I think our next thing we're going to go do from there is uh, bring in a portable foot restraint. Mm -hmm. uh, I think of these portable foot restraints as ski bindings uh, to hold us to the space station. There's times when we have to go put a lot of torque or force on the space station to uh, turn a wheel, turn a bolt, and we need something to take that reaction load. Otherwise, we'll just simply go the opposite way mm -hmm. because we're, we don't have any weight in space. Uh, we've got probably a dozen of these foot restraints in different spots around the space station, and we can unplug them and take them to places. Um, but they need to be updated. There's some new equipment uh, and configurations that need to be done. So this one is one of the remaining ones that needs to be brought inside. Uh, so we'll grab that one uh, and bring it inside. But first we need to take a, another foot restraint out there to that spot and plug it in. There's this huge tool stanchions attached to it and it's, it's not something you want to lug around. So we'll just simply move the short distance to the one that's already fixed and we'll bring the one that needs updating back into the airlock uh, for repair. Okay. Um, once we're done with that, uh, we've got a uh, light and camera assembly out on the starboard truss. Uh, it gives us great views of the earth, great views of the stack uh, from out there in the truss, and great views of the solar arrays. However, with this new ELC-4 platform that we're taking out to the space station, uh, a lot of the views outboard are going to be blocked, and a lot of the cameras, uh, its views are blocked by this new platform. In order to recover some of that field of view, we're going to have to take this whole post and cant it inboard about 30 degrees mm -hmm. and give you some more views, let you have more views of the earth, more views of the space station. So we, when you take out a wedge, a big shim, and put it between that light stanchion and the truss itself to hold this thing inboard about 30 degrees. And Tim and I will do that task together. Uh, well, next thing we're going to do is set up so we can take this mobile service, um, mobile base system, mm -hmm. that arm that sits on a, based on a rail car, uh, let it go out past the end of the starboard truss one, S, S1 truss. Uh, it's a, able to go out into the rotating components of the space station on S3 and outboard, uh, provided there's a, a linkage in that rail system that lets it go across. Mm -hmm. So what we're going to do is put up just basically a mini bridge, um, and they're, they're called rail stubs, that allow this, the wheels um, for that rail car to move from the S1 truss outboard onto the S3 truss and we'll go ahead and clamp those two down. There'll be just two we'll put up there. Uh, we've also got some stops out there to physically keep this thing from rolling off the edge of S1 before they had these stubs out there. Mm -hmm. And so, and they're just on hinges. We simply roll those stops down out of the way and allow that rail car to go inboard and outboard from there. And that's gonna be the big part of our task right there. Um, let's see. And finally, uh, we have a payload uh, from the Japanese Space Agency. It's called Message in a Bottle. Uh, we're simply going to open this bottle up and get a, a sample of the vacuum of space. Uh, it's a big thermos bottle and we open it up and allow it to uh, equalize with the vacuum of space out there and then we seal it back up. Uh, oddly enough, being out there in space, you've got a, a better vacuum there than you can get here on Earth with any kind of pumps, so you really have a more perfect vacuum. Uh, we'll get some photographs uh, for the Japanese Space Agency and we'll bring that in and that would wrap up our first uh, spacewalk. And for the second EVA, what's the current plan for that one? Okay, for the second day spacewalk, uh, I'll start off on my part to go out to that failed uh, pump module mm -hmm. 
and there's some residual ammonia sitting in that tank. This isn't the kind of the, like the bottle of ammonia you have under sitting on your sink in the kitchen or your bathroom. Uh, this is 100% ammonia. It's pretty noxious stuff, mm. um, and we don't really want to carry that back down to earth with us. Uh, so what we can do is vent that out into space you know, where it's harmless and we can bring it back in an empty tank, mm. uh, empty pump module. So what I'll do is uh, take a vent line that I've already set up on the first day spacewalk when we bring back this failed pump module. I'll connect that vent line to the uh, module itself and close a, a bale to let it vent itself out in space. And it takes about maybe 90 seconds, two minutes for all the ammonia to vent itself overboard. Mm -hmm. uh, once that's done, I'll close up and cap that failed module, uh, close up the tent flap behind it, and let it sit until a future mission brings it back to Earth. Um, and then what I'll do is take that vent, those vent tools and those bags that were left over from that original spacewalk, uh, put them back in the original bags and put them back on top of the uh, airlock uh, where those bags stay for any, for any future times we have to change another pump module or any uh, spacewalk for repair. Mm -hmm. um, once I'm done with that, I'll head out onto what was um, our normal profile for the, you know, doing the repairs on the space station. Uh, we have uh, the, that platform, that ELC-4 platform that we're putting out on the um, S3 truss segment. Uh, there's a computer control box. I can't remember what platform needed computer control, but this one does. And it has a thermal blanket on it to keep it from getting overly warm. Mm -hmm. and, well, it needed that for the launch part, but for sitting in space, it doesn't need that blanket. So I'll go out and grab that blanket and roll it up and put it in a bag. Uh, and if you've ever seen Charlie Brown and Linus's blanket, that, that's the part that worries about me. This blanket <laughs> suddenly turns <laughs> ugly and attacks me. Uh, we had some bags, I call them jettison stowage bags. They're just, they're, they're laundry bags. It's a glorified name for a laundry bag. They're sitting out on one of our CETA carts, one of those hand portable rail carts, mm -hmm. six under the mobile base um, system. And uh, we'll grab those three bags and put them in the same bag as that blanket. And uh, we'll untie them. They were taken out for the pump module uh, repair task by Doug Wheelock and Tracy Caldwell Dyson uh, earlier and I'll go and clean those up and bring them back in for this one so we can stage them for the next task for the time we go outside. Okay. Uh, once that's done, I'll go over to the uh, port side of the, of the truss segment. Uh, there is a working light that we can put inside for people who do work inside the truss because it's obviously dark even when the sun's up. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's called a CETA light. And I will take that light out there and install that one and get it plugged in and, and then they can do a quick power check while I'm out there. And it'll be on S3. Uh, I'll come inboard from that task and go up to the very roof of that truss segment on S1 where S1 meets the rotating components from S3. Uh, there is a, uh, one of the boxes out there has a connector to it, uh, a you know, big data connector, and the bale itself needs to be shielded from sunlight so it doesn't get too hot or too cold. Um, some of that shielding, that blanket has peeled away and the program's concerned that it's getting sunlight, it's getting put through, you know, getting too hot. Mm -hmm. I'll simply take that blanket, put it back over top of the, the, the connector and use a wire tie, it, it's a coat hanger, uh, uh, from, from, really that's all it is, and wrap it around that to hold it down so it doesn't peel back again. Okay. Uh, take a quick picture of it so people can see it's in a proper configuration. And then I'll head down to the, the underside of that same truss uh, on the earth side of it and where we've got these uh, basically receivers for a, um, these grapple bars that go on the radiators. The radiators themselves, you know, they, they fold out like accordions. Mm -hmm. And when we, if they're folded up, in order to move and, and install them for replacement, uh, they've got this big, like, it's like a double Y-shaped um, beam mm -hmm. um, that allows you to grapple. Uh, it, it itself ties to the radiators and it has a grapple fixture on it so the robot arm can grapple to it. Well, when you've got the radiator deployed, you need some place to park that grapple beam. And so we've got these stowage receptacles for it. And on a previous spacewalk, they went out there and tried to bolt them down and the bolts just wouldn't sit quite, so they're wobbly. Mm -hmm. uh, my job is to go out there and take a look at it, do some troubleshooting to see if we can figure out why these things aren't cinched down as tightly as they'd like them cinched. And if I can, fix it so that they are cinched down mm -hmm. uh, where they need to be. I'll look at both those beams and when I'm done with that task, I'll head over to node three, uh, the newest module on the space station. Uh, where we have a, a row of connectors on the very uh, portmost side of it, the outboard side of that, not, of that module. Uh, there's a blanket over top of it, and we'd like to remove that blanket so we can have access to all of the power and data um, connections out there for future uh, missions. And so it's a, just a 
strip of cloth, maybe about three or four feet long. I'll roll that up and put it into the bag and make off with that. I think once that's done, I'll head back to the airlock and drop that bag off, pick up uh, a lens cover uh, to put on to one of our cameras. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the glass itself, we'd like something that we can replace so if it gets pitted or scratched, you don't have to bring the whole camera home. Mm -hmm. This one sits up on top of that mobile base system uh, up on the very front face of the space station. Uh, it's called a POA. And don't ask me what the POA no, stands for, but it, it's, a, it's a fixed receptacle that you can, you can bring modules in and it'll grapple to them the same way that the robot arm uh, grapples uh, to an object. And that's where we had that failed pump module. It's been, it sits there um, until we do our spacewalk to remove it. Uh, I'm going to go out on the camera on that one and simply put a protective lens cover over top of it and then head back down to the, to the airlock with Tim and that should wrap up our second spacewalk. Uh, after your work on station is complete, uh, you will undock and prepare for the trip back to Earth. Uh, it, it might be uh, one of the last opportunities for anybody to see a space station from the vantage point of inside of, of a shuttle while back in a way. Um, as you sit here today trying to imagine that moment, what, what goes through your head about, about the profoundness of that? Um, a little bit sad, also a little bit happy that you know, the space shuttle has done such good things to be able to be one of those lucky people to get to see that from the shuttle. Um, uppermost in my mind, I know when I'm there doing it because the same thing you know, last time I backed away from the space station was get the pictures. Yeah. Um, you want to have some just some really good shots to bring back to everybody of that. It's the only chance you get to see certain parts of the space station um, is the camera shots we take while we're undocking and flying away. It's also some of the big you know photographic moments, you know, things that people really want to see. They're really gorgeous shots you get at the space station and it's nice to you know, be able to share those views with people on the ground. So I'm going to have a camera handy and all my, my battery of lenses out there to, and try and, and get, get good shots of the space station as we're walking and getting away. So it's not just me trying to describe uh, how beautiful it was when I pulled away. People will see it with their own two eyes. Uh, this mission is uh, scheduled to be one of the last space shuttle missions. Um, what does it mean to you to have, to have had a part in the space shuttle program? You know, you know I didn't appreciate how lucky I was to be in the space shuttle program when I first got here. I was just happy to be an astronaut and being in the space program and the shuttle was a way to get into space. In our space program, we've been in space now for what, since the late 50s, early 60s. Um, we've only had one program with a hypersonic um, re-entry vehicle that landed like an airplane and had the capability of a shuttle. No other spacecraft I know of have, have robot arms. Um, you know, the spacecraft out there, you know, come back into the atmosphere and land like an airplane, take off like a rocket, and do the things that, that the space shuttle does. Um, and I don't know we're going to get there for a very long time. It was, a, it was a pretty bold and audacious thing we did back in the 60s and 70s to build such a spacecraft. And to have been one of the people who got to be a crew member on board, uh, something with that type of capability, um, it's just, it's, it's a privilege. Uh, I just assumed that once the shuttle was done flying that we would have something bigger and more capable that would take us further, you know, in the shuttles that might go to the moon or something like that. Uh, but we've gone the other way. We're going to capsules. Uh, and of course, they don't necessarily need something as big and complex for what we have uh, envisioned for NASA out in the future. Um, and I understand that, but, but basically, you, know, you understand that it's, you know, we're not gonna have something that, that's as cool as the shuttle was. You know, it, uh, it, it's more practical. Uh, this is also scheduled to be the, the last flight of, of Space Shuttle Discovery. Uh, it, it's the most accomplished shuttle in, in the shuttle fleet. Um, if, if you had to compile a, a list of Discovery's greatest hits, um, missions, uh, uh, activities, events it's been involved in, what, which, which ones come to mind that, that you would say would definitely have to be on that list? Well, I understand that I'm, I had the perspective of a test pilot. And the holy grail if you're a test pilot is to fly the first mission of anything. You know, anytime you get a brand new airplane comes out, you want to go fly that first flight. Or if you take some new configuration, you want to be the one to take it up for the first time to go see, um, will it work? Mm -hmm. Or discover something new that nobody's seen before. And so given that, and Discovery's past, and I understand that Columbia was the first shuttle to actually fly. Um, but Discovery was the very first shuttle to fly after we lost Challenger. Uh, after we completely reconfigured the solid rocket motors and the configuration of the space shuttle, uh, the, the first one to go out there and, and, and tiptoe back out there um, was were the crew aboard Discovery. 
Uh, likewise, after we lost Columbia uh, several years ago, the first shuttle to fly back in space again uh, was Discovery. And we learned a lot from that. We also, we grounded ourselves again because we discovered a lot of things that were still problems with that, uh, with what we were trying to fix. Mm -hmm. And so we had a, a second you know, first flight. Uh, and again, a year later, on, on SDS-121 was again Discovery. Uh, this was the one that was out there you know, assuming the risks, you know, exploring the unknown uh, with these crews aboard. And I would say, for me at least, uh, those were the most um, significant accomplishments aboard Discovery. Uh, was Because each time this thing flew, it was a brand new shuttle. And it looks ex looked externally like the old shuttles we had before, but we had done extensive remodeling and refitting and reconfiguring. And every time you do that, there's an opportunity for things to go wrong. You have untested and unproven systems, and you got to go shake those out. So those are probably some of the most um, dangerous missions that we flew, um, clearly some of the most ambitious and daring ones. And each one of those times, it was Discovery was the one that was making that voyage. How would you characterize um, what Space Shuttle um, has meant to the advancement of human e uh, space exploration. Space Shuttle was, again, the most ambitious, most complex vehicle that we've ever built. Now, the Soviet Union tried hard to you know, make their own version of a space shuttle. Never got a single person in space aboard that shuttle itself. Uh, they flew it uh, unmanned for one orbit around the Earth and landed it, and then they were done. Um, it tells you how difficult it was to have pulled it off in the first place. Um, by the time we're done here, we'll have had 134 missions aboard this uh, particular um, shuttle. Uh, we'll have built the largest, most complex structure that's ever been put up in, in orbit ever. Uh, we'll have put up the Hubble telescope. Uh, we'll have done just things that we never would have thought were capable, the shuttle was capable of doing, even when we designed it back in the 1970s. Uh, it's, it's set the bar. It set the expectations of what we can do in space. Um, when we first put the shuttle up or designed this thing, we had just gone to the moon. That was about it. You know, we had a few, you know, a few capsules gone up in space and splashed back down. We had a few communication satellites up in orbit, but routine access to space was something for science fiction writers. And now it's not. You have a whole generation of people. And if you were born back when we first started doing the shuttle, you, you'd have your own kids, and so you and your children would both would have grown up with the expectation that, of course, we routinely go into space and we do things like put up space stations and space telescopes.